Um, we go on to the next page, and I think this is a terrible derivation, and I'm going to skip over this. You can read through all of this if you want to. We make some mathematical arguments um, that I don't think are very powerful. Um, but really what we come up with at the end of this and what you need to read at your own pace and understand is essentially equation 3.3.7 down here where he basically defines um, psi in terms of this parameter z naught, And z naught is something that we're going to explain physically in a couple more slides, but z naught is given by this, and this is one of these things that if you can memorize equations, you should memorize. If you have notes you need to refer to as you do all your problems in this class, you should write this on your notes and remember it, because this is essentially pretty important. Um, and notice you can write z naught in terms of w naught, which is the size of the beam, and lambda naught, which is the wavelength, or you can write w naught in terms of lambda naught and z naught. They're, they're essentially identical equations. And we're going to see what this w naught means in just a little bit. Okay, moving on to page 68. Um, now what he does is he takes another huge step that's very, very difficult to understand. But he defines the Q parameter, the thing that's going to give us the solution to the beams in terms of an R and a Z. And he really seems to be pulling these terms out of thin air um, because they just sort of appear in there. We've seen W of Z before. But, but what this is saying, what equation 3.3.8 is saying, is that when the people solved this for the first time and people figured it out, they needed to tie this Q parameter, which is just a mathematical solution, into things that can be measured, into things that have physical meaning if you measure a laser beam. And we're going to see that R of Z right here and this W of Z, which appears in this complex equation right here, um, do have physical meanings, and we can physically measure these things. And so he's just writing Q in terms of things that can be physically measured. He then goes back, substitutes Q into this equation, so he's coming out with a horrible-looking equation for uh, the beam profile. Um, and he then defines W of Z, an equation we'll see again, but this is very important. Um, he also defines R of Z in terms of what he's known, and now he goes essentially and says here, and so let me highlight this because this is, I think, really an understatement that these equations require considerable discussion to appreciate the physical interpretation. Um, <laughs> that is very much an understatement. But essentially what he's going to do at this point is he's going to solve for P, the last little piece of the puzzle, and finally, and we're almost done with going through the book, trust me on this, is that after he does this derivation, he comes up with the field expression for a laser beam after substituting all of this back in. And this right here is the equation. The first part, which describes how the amplitude varies with space, the amplitude factor we call it, multiplied by the second part that says how the phase of our electric field, and don't ever forget that fields have phase, that say how the waves vary as a function of space. Um, how the phase varies along the laser beam, so our laser beam is essentially coming up here and spreading out. We'll see this picture over and over and over again. And essentially the amplitude factor says how the beam is confined in space. And the longitudinal phase says how the wave, which is varying very quickly, varies along the direction of propagation of the beam in that way. And then finally we have a radial phase factor right here which says how the phase varies as we go radially outward in the R direction. Um, and we'll see what that looks like in a little bit here. Um, but all three of these terms are multiplied together to give the electric field of a laser beam. And of course, um, we've used some terms in our equation that you have to define, so the equation is going to look a lot worse if you don't put your W of Z, Z naught, and R of Z in the equation, and those things are defined down here. Here's W of Z, here's R of Z, and here's Z naught, and of course you substitute those back into this equation. So we come up with a really horrible looking equation if we put all of this in, 
However, the nice thing about this equation is it can be very easily programmed into a computer to do the solutions we want. We will not be working longhand and doing analytical solutions to this equation, but it's very important that you do understand what the equation means and how you tie measurements of a laser beam, the propagation of a laser beam, into this equation because this is how you're going to calculate how the beam from your optical tweezers can be focused down tightly enough to grab particles and move them around. And that's the end of the book section you had to read. Um, so let's go ahead and look at these three terms again. Uh, here we have a picture of a laser beam. This first equation is the amplitude factor. It describes the beam spread. It's a purely real term. There are no imaginary components in there. And essentially what it says is if a laser beam starts off with a size w naught, this term right here, this first term, explains how the beam is going to spread out in space. Because w naught is defined at z equals 0. And out here at some other place in the beam, we have w of z. So this first term describes, the amplitude factor, describes how the beam gets bigger as it propagates through space. And the second term here is the longitudinal phase factor. And let me go ahead and get a, a different color pin here. Let me go to a ballpoint because I'm going to need to draw some tiny stuff. And let's get some nice green ink. And essentially what's going to happen here is as this sucker propagates, um, the phase is going to be changing very, very rapidly in the z direction of the function of a wavelength. So we're going to have waves that look like that. And every one of these lines is a phase front, spaced one period apart. So this term describes essentially how the wave propagates. And you'll look and see that this term, e to the minus jkz, is essentially a plane wave. A laser beam propagates as a plane wave with a small correction factor that for most cases you're never going to see in your life and can be ignored. The third term in the equation of the electric field of a laser beam is the radial phase factor. And essentially what it says is, let me get some blue ink here, it says how the phase is changing radially. And you'll notice that, let's go ahead and erase all of this, you'll notice that near the waist, the place where z is equal to 0, this way the phase is constant, it's unchanging. We essentially have a plane wave. And a laser beam near a waist, or its minimum position, is like spatially confined plane waves. However, as we get further and further out away from the beam, the phase fronts get spherical. And of course, how that phase changes, how the beam curves, is defined by the radial phase factor. And radial just means r, out in that direction like that.